David, we should have stand still on some of our major highways. We'll have a lot of hazardous waste for the whole night, right? I've been an industrial designer for more than 20 years now. Notice the gray hair. Industrial designers pride themselves on coming up with incredibly creative solutions to seemingly impossible problems. Uh, I've done that myself and with my team on uh, baby toys, medical products, kitchen appliances, ATMs, and a lot of things that are not cool enough to show in our portfolio. We pride ourselves on finding inspiration from everyone and everywhere. We surround ourselves with researchers, strategists, marketers, engineers, a whole world of really creative and bright people. In 2014, I was approached by Peter Nowarski from the University of Akron. He suggested it would be a really good idea to have their biomimicry PhD fellows work with us on some real world design problems. Um, now, I didn't tell him this at the time, but actually I thought it was not such a really good idea, so sorry, Peter. And, and the reason being, how, how, could, how could somebody who, who spends all their time, and this, this is where my head was, how can someone who spends all their time researching eggshells, right? How could they come in and, and jump on a real design project? And, and if anyone's worked on a design project, uh, you'll know that you don't have a lot of time and you typically don't have a huge budget. So we had some pretty, pretty tough things to deal with. Now, I needed a, a concept, I needed some, some, something in, in, not three years, but I needed something in more like three weeks. So I decided, why not? Let's do this. We agreed to it. And uh, I thought to myself, this, this should be pretty fun. Well, I'm glad that I didn't realize Renee's attitude to, before I started working with him. At least I can speak for the fellows that we were really excited and looking forward to working with a design firm on a real design challenge and, and for a real client. But I have to admit, I kind of was intimate, intimidated as far as well, and I, wasn't, I was a little bit hesitant. I wasn't sure what we, are, what we were gonna be able to bring to such an experienced design team. Well, luckily, they didn't give me much time to think about it, and they immediately looped me into one of their existing design challenges, and um, their client needed to see results in less than three weeks, so I just had to jump with it. So the project that Daphne was privileged to work on was to develop a new conveyor lift system. Huh? All right, so let's put it a different way. We needed to design a new low-cost vertical movement system. So it wasn't a toy, it wasn't a, a cool kitchen blender, it was something a lot more mundane. Now, as we always do, the design team springs to life. We approach the problem from all kinds of angles. We look at things uh, in a way that normal people don't see things, and, and so when I say normal, I'm implying that we're not normal, and, and I'd say that's true, we're, we're a little abnormal, and, and she can agree with that. So what we like to do in our process is we like to take the, the project apart and deconstruct it. So when we deconstruct the problem, we go down multiple paths, and we look for uh, very unique, uh, uh, the unobvious connections. Now these things can lead to a game-changing product, and that's why we do what we do. So uh, I honestly, our, our process works really well. The process has worked well for a long time. And, and honestly, what, what could a biomimesis bring to us that we wouldn't already try? So uh, you guys probably have some ideas in your mind. And, and looking at the screen, you, you probably would be thinking the way I think about things, I'm well, guessing. When I was uh, listening, observing the designers at work, I started to get nervous, but also excited. I actually was thinking really differently. And this is how my mind must have somewhat looked like. Probably, that's really different, right? Um, well, it took me a lot of courage, but I finally threw out some of my crazy ideas. What about how motor proteins warp over muscle fibers and they cause contraction in muscles? And elephants, they're able to pick almost any kind of object and move it around easily. And have you heard of the spider? It's able to pick up its prey from walking from the ground and, and pulls it up all the way into a spider web with a single silk thread. They all stared at me. <laughs> oh yes, we did. 
designers, for lack of a better term, are, are open-minded, okay? A lot of cliches I'll throw out there. We're extremely open-minded. Ideas come from everywhere. We, we, we push the boundaries, right? But uh, Daphne has ha, had pushed our boundaries beyond imagination. So uh, spider webs, elephant trunks, and whatever the other thing was. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy talk, right? So we decided, though, all right, uh, it, it was her first day, so we committed to this. Let's let her go. All right. So, so help me out and, and explain to me how a spider web works and, and how we can make a manufactured product out of it. Well, I just, luckily, I just happened to have talked to Dr. Blackledge, a, a professor at the university who's doing a lot of research on spider silk, the properties of spider silk. And he explained to me that there are certain spiders called cobweb weaving spiders that are able to capture their prey in a very unique way. They have gum food silk threads that, upon agitation by the momentum of an upcoming prey, can easily detach from its substrate and pulls it up all the way into a spider web. That really sounded like low-cost vertical movement to me. <laughs> you see what I had to deal with? <laughs> all right, so it, it's complicated, OK? And, and so I'm not going to go to a client and say, you need to have a factory full of spiders weaving silk oh, all no, day. Oh, no, I, I don't it's, think that that would be a great idea. I mean, telling your client, just get a bunch of uh, black widows, I think they quite literally might run away. <laughs> What we had to do was abstract the complicated biology. We had to get rid of the complicated biological language, and we had to generalize the, the principle by ir removing irrelevant specifics so that we can broaden our solution thinking. So, it, 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 <laughs> see, I'm still dealing with this. We've been working on this a while, right? So, all right, explain to me then how a spider web works. How would a, how would it pull up its prey? Well. A, a silk, the silk thread is actually under constant tension, and it's attached in such a way to the ground that when the spider hits it, it easily detaches, and then because of the tension, it pulls it up into its uh, spider web. So I guess, I mean, isn't it pretty similar to a rubber band when you hold it tightly and then release it? <laughs> ah, you see what she did to me? All right, now I get it. All right, so, so we're connecting. We're really connecting uh, at the spider web for the life of me, I couldn't make that connection. Now we're talking about a rubber band. I do make the connection. So if we pull it up, we're not using any power, we're not using any motors, and, and this makes sense. I started to really see the connection here, and if we could go to a client with a, a lower cost, uh, low tech, green solution, well that's always a big win. So now I'm in. So it took the team quite some uh, open-mindedness and effort, but we finally were able to abstract the, the biology into a usable design principle. Motion that's created by wires and that retains stored energy and only releases it when needed. It was now that, we, that I, at least, was confident that they were actually understanding me. And we found a common language that we could use in productive ideation and solution thinking. Absolutely, now is the time when we really got to come together. So the design team and Daphne and everyone were working on a common principle. We had a common goal, we had a common goal from the start, but now we had a common path that we could follow. So, so there, there's an example of some, uh, some crazy design sketches that we come up with and, and whiteboarding and, and post-it notes and everything else. And at this point, Daphne's on the whiteboard sketching, and nobody's chuckling now. As, as we move forward in the process, we, we, we pull together a lot of physical, traditional design principles, motors, gears, all the things that most people know, and the spider web, and actually came to a, a great hybrid solution. So you're probably wondering, what could we possibly have come up with that would make sense and pull all of this together? Well. Introducing the biomimetic low-cost vertical movement concept. Now the cool thing about this concept is we've got the spider web and we've got the prey. So if we need to move the package upward, the package is the prey and the elastic band system is the spider web. So now we've got an elastic band system that when it's pulled taut and it's tensioned, we actually can pull up the prey when the prey or the package hits the bottom platform. So a great idea that worked well. Uh, it still needs to be prototyped, so we're still early. But uh, the cool thing is, is also with the elastic band system, we were able to store the energy in an energy recovery system. So 
they think about an energy recovery system is going to take the energy from the upward motion and store it for later use. An energy recovery system is kind of like a uh, regenerative braking system on some uh, uh, hybrid and electric cars that you see today, and I think they developed it for Formula One. So it's a system that exists. Uh, it helps us be a little greener. And the cool thing about it is how better to use the recovery system than to reset the system. So when we pull the platform back down and we can assist in retensioning the bands or the spider web, that's a great idea. So in the end, we were really only able to do this because we actually listened and learned something and used the biomimetic approach and the spider web. I'm so glad that they captured that on video. <laughs> um, well, although I am trained as a biomimicry specialist and I'm getting my PhD in biomimicry, I had never been in a situation as real as this one before. And for me, it was a confirmation that biomimicry can bring really refreshing uh, perspectives and can lead rapidly to innovative and sustainable ideas. However, it, Renee and I aren't necessarily here to convince you about the power behind biomimicry because Janine Banyas's TED Talks are way better at doing that. So if you haven't already seen them, please do so. You'll be fascinated about what you can learn from nature. What we're trying to do is address the disconnect between uh, people that are inspired by biomimicry and those who are actually doing it. Because biomim biomimicry, you need a lot of practice to get good at it, at, at it. And so our talk won't make you a biomimicry master. But what we're trying to achieve is by having shared our untold experience that is that it shows that you really need to be truly open-minded, persistent, and just emerge yourself in it. Because you'll be really surprised by the outcomes, just as we were. But for those who need a little bit more tangible than just to merge yourself, we, meaning the designers, uh, were able to visualize our biomimicry journey. And I can assure you, it feels way more complex than this. Uh, designers are trained to make simplify things. Um, what, so what it represents is we got together because we had to work on this design. And although we were in the same room, we were still com uh, completely separate identities. We each had our own language, and although we were listening to each other, at least most of the times, uh, we weren't really hearing each other. And it, we only came closer because we were asking, when we started asking the same question, how does nature solve our problem? And through persistence and open-mindedness of the whole team, and, and we, were, we were able to collaboratively abstract the biology and turn it into a usable design principle that we were able to use in productive uh, collaboration towards a biomimetic solution. And I think I was pretty clear that I, I was really skeptical at first. And I was skeptical for, well, quite a long time into the process. But I, I, mean, I was wrong, all right? So there's something else you get. So I was absolutely wrong. It, it really, uh, it, it surprised me. Uh, when, when we started to work together and we started to, to come to the principle uh, as, as a team and we started down the same path, it all really, really made sense. We, we, we challenge status quo all the time. We ask our clients to do the same thing. We, we do it all the time. We push it out. But this time, they brought that to us. So, so they challenged our status quo. They challenged us in ways that, that we hadn't been challenged before. And, and it's never easy to take your own medicine. So, but we did. We did that, and we learned an awful lot. Uh, I, I, and it was Daphne and Emily and Bill who were the three biomimicry fellows we work with, and they were all outstanding. They each worked on an independent project, uh, three different projects, and we came to some really outstanding, incredible conclusions because of working with them. At this point, I'm really, I'm convinced that biomimicry is a, a legitimate uh, problem solving and design approach that, uh, that can be utilized not only in design, uh, but in a lot of other places. And, and if you think about it, it could be a, a unique selling proposition for your company or your business. So uh, I'll admit, I, I was definitely, I was wrong, and you're not just a scientist focused only on long-term eggshell research. Well, and, and that's actually a really great point to, to end our talk with, is that, the, that we realized during the preparation of our talk that the proper education is such an important uh, aspect for stimulating these rewarding collaborations. Because there's a lot of value in typical science PhDs that focus on fundamental research in one specific area. 
But there's also an urgent and a high need for people that get trained to, be, to, be, to work in a really interdisciplinary and applied environment. Because ultimately, these will be the people that, are, that will be able to abstract existing biological knowledge. There's already so much out there, and, but nobody, or, or these kind of people will be able to understand it and communicate it to others who cannot as easily understand it. And those are also the kind of people that will create opportunities because they can uh, connect seemingly unrelated thoughts, fields, and even people. And these will also be the kind of people that were best in, in, in places somewhere within, but especially between exist, existing silos. And it's a, a truly exciting time now because formal education and biomimicry is starting to appear. And so we really hope that these kind of programs will focus beyond nature-inspired um, research, but be truly integrative. Because, at least for me, it was after having worked at a design, design firm that I started asking different kind of questions about my research. And I'm now seeing many, many more opportunities of, of where and how I can apply what I'm learning and also set up interdisciplinary collaborations to see it become realized. So we think that it's only with a collaborative mindset from both academia and industry that biomimicry will become a um, feasible approach to be commonly used to solve uh, real life and even time sensitive challenges and, and this will have the highest possible and, and especially positive impact on our lives and, and that of the planet. So thank you.